Hey folks, how you doing? I'm Chris Charbonneau. I'm the associate publisher for Spin Sheet Magazine. Welcome to another Spin Sheet Happy Hour. It's uh, Friday, June 12th, five o'clock. You know, it's five o'clock somewhere. More importantly, it's five o'clock right here. Uh, tonight we are sponsored by Mount Gay Rum. Very thankful to have Mount Gay with us. Um, and uh, we'll be uh, mixing up uh, a new signature cocktail, compliments of Mount Gay. Um, and I just wanted to point something out. So uh, if you've tuned in last week, you probably knew that uh, Mount Gay was our, our, our sponsor and very happy to have them. This is really cool. Um, and they, of course, you know, in the sponsorship, one of the cool things is they actually send us samples. And uh, I, I received three bottles of, uh, of Mount Gay, which is fantastic. I am not complaining whatsoever, except for one thing. So if you'll look at this picture that they said, hey, you know, they say, Chris, can you show this picture during the, during, uh, you know, the episode? I said, sure. And I noticed that there are four bottles in this photo, not, not three. And uh, I, I got to say, I, I have, they sent me a bottle of the Eclipse. Uh, the Black Barrel is a lovely rum. I made a Black and Stormy last week. Um, the Mount Gay XO, I mean, that's pretty nice but not the 1703. And I kind of went, what, what's going on with that? Um, and then I looked at what the price was and I went, oh, <laughs> I'm not good enough for that. And uh, so I, it's okay, Mount Gay. Maybe we're, we're just, maybe it's a test. Maybe, maybe that's just, uh, we're going to see how well we do a spin sheet. And then maybe later on, we'll send an entire case of 1703 to Chris and the gang at spin sheet. And um uh, Anyway, not, try, not that I'm trying to plant ideas in your head, but if that were the case, that would be lovely. Um, so um, moving on just real quick, um, we've got, uh, not only do we have Mount Gay as our sponsor, but we also have um, our ongoing uh, uh, prize sponsor, which is Boat Life. Boat Life is one of the oldest brands in boating out there, and they're very well known for, uh, for a lot of their products, but specifically for their cleaning products. And uh, tonight, as our prize giveaway, uh, we're giving away their mildew remover. Um, and what, how this works is if you ask a question um, and uh, we use it on air and that you just use it in the, uh, in the comments section, um, we'll draw, we'll, we'll put your name in a hat. And at the end, if you, uh, uh, if your name comes out, we're going to send you a nice bottle of mildew remover, um, which, you know, is pretty cool actually, because it works and mildew is a pain in the butt to get out. Um, so, but just as, just so everybody knows if, um, uh, oops, there we go. Um, if you don't win, it's okay. Cause everybody's a winner on spin sheet. And that means that you can also go to, to boatlife.com and, uh, use a discount code spin nine. If you would, uh, we'll get you 25% off, uh, all the products there. So not, so not just buy the mildew remover, but like any one of their products and they've got a lot. Um, so check them out. We really appreciate it because without our advertisers, we can't do this. So um, if you would, if you support them, you support us. Now, I'm going to bring on Molly. And she's coming. Hey, Molly. Hey, Star Power. Yeah, happy Friday. Happy Friday to you. It's a, it's a lovely See, day. I, I'm not. I'm not in, in my remote office this week. I'm at the Spin Sheet World Headquarters, Sweet. where uh, where I've been I'll answering be the phone, which was a really bad move. <laughs> it's like, I had some things to do. I was like, I got to quit answering the phone here. Don't answer the phone. Never wow. answer the phone. How is yeah. the office? Is the office doing all right without us? It, it's a little lonely. It's yeah. a little lonely, and I, I had I had to turn the air conditioner on, but um, you know, it misses us. It misses mm -hmm. us as a team. But you know we're 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 all doing pretty well, I think. So um, good. So anyway, enough about the office. What are we drinking? What are we drinking? Okay, guys, uh, time for the signature cocktail. Um, last week we we made a um, a black and stormy, uh, which was the uh, Mount Gay Black Barrel Rum, and it was it was tasty. It was very very tasty. Um, tonight we're making an XO Cocoa Hill. Now Molly, I like coconut. Okay. What does XO stand for? Hugs and kisses. Hugs and kisses. Actually, no, it doesn't have stand for that. I'm glad you said that. Though. Commanding officer. Uh, uh, no, that's a good guess though. Um, stands for extra. Like old. Town, you know. No, it stands for extra old. 
Um, it's kind of like <laughs> something we all aspire to. Well, I don't know, maybe. Um, <laughs> I think it's talking about the rum, not us. Yeah, um, exactly. uh, but anyway, um, it's it's a fairly simple drink to make. Um, but uh, basically, you you grab your bottle of uh, Mount Gay XO. Um, you take a rather large ice cube that I, I, I had to, they're almost impossible to get out of the, the big ice cube tray, but this is a, um, a coconut, excuse me, coconut water ice cube, okay? So go get yourself some coconut water, put it in the freezer, you get ice. Put it in a rocks glass. And you pour, guess how much, Molly? Um, two ounces, like two last ounces. week. Exactly, two ounces um, of XO. By the way, there's a reason Sharp is not a bartender because his idea of two ounces is. I'm the kinda, best bartender. It's kind of special. I'm not. I'm the one. <laughs> if, you, if you were the bartender, you would get fired. Yeah, well, exactly. I'm loved by the patrons. I'm not loved by the owner. Um, but anyhow, so now. Uh, the coconut water is sort of soaking into the drink here. Um, it has to be served in a rocks glass like this. Um, cheers. Cheers. Okay. That's good. In fact, I think it should stand for a hug and a kiss because it, it certainly makes That's me... That's it. Nice it's just coconut glass. water. Just coconut water it's ice coconut cube. Coconut water. But it's smooth. Smooth, Ma. It's really smooth. Um, I'm just having a little monkey and ginger myself, a little light and breezy for a hot afternoon. Okay. And I'm having it in the 20th anniversary spin sheet cup, which is now five years old. Right. Not yeah. sure we're going to end up with 25 year anniversary cups because we have a lot happening in this 25 year anniversary, True including that. happy hours. Including happy hours. But, you know, no better way to celebrate 25 years. Um, Molly, we got an awesome show tonight. Why don't we uh... have an awesome show tonight? We have um, we have David Flynn and Greg Gendel from Quantum Sales to talk about how to be a great bow person. So I'm some of you well. probably read David's article in the May issue of Spin Sheet. Hi, David. Hi, Greg. Hey guys. Hey guys. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna go through a series of questions. Um, Dave is going to answer them a little bit more from the academic perspective, and Greg is going to give us a little bit of real-world knowledge from the bow. And uh, cool. and Sharber, are you are you going to go off to the Control Central? I am, but I, I want to know what what uh, Dave and Greg are drinking. Oh yeah. Well, we don't have any 1703 here either, which is too bad because yeah. that would be. That would be good sipping rum. I, if they could send me a bottle of that, I, I will have some. But no, I'm I'm sticking to a uh, a simple margarita, but it's made with fruit. It's it's healthy, um, and because uh, you need your vitamin. Done, yeah, I need vitamins, and it's done in a proper adult glass. This is the only chance I get to use a martini glass um, and not spill. Awesome, Greg. What's on the menu? Uh, so tonight I have a, uh, I think the same exact thing as Molly. So I have a um, Mount Gay and ginger beer in the same cup as Molly also. I will say you showed, <laughs> yeah. you showed this a little bit earlier. And, and Greg, Great minds think alike. That's true. Greg, if you show the 20 to the camera, I just want to point out that yours is much more used than Molly's. <laughs> just saying. Same age. Uh -huh. Anyway. Well, I'm going to sign out here to let you guys get going. And uh, we'll get some great questions up here, too. And uh, we'll talk to you all later. All right. Thank you, Char. Thank you. So, David, um, I'm going to start with you. Um, and then just, just real briefly before we get into the meat of it and talking about being a, a great bow person, let's just find out a little bit, you know, if you can give it to me in a one minute to tell me a little bit about your sailing background. And um, that's it. Your sailing, your sailing background in a, in about a minute. Well, I'm not, and, and, and never have been a great bow person. I, I full disclaimer right up front on that. Um, I can I can talk a pretty good game though, and that's the important thing. Um, you know, I I had a an atypical uh, sailing uh, upbringing. I did not go through a yacht club. My parents didn't sail. Nobody in my family sailed. I kind of fell in love with it romantically. You know, reading books and stuff. I made my parents wallpaper my walls in charts 
so I could sort of have that. So it was strictly a romantic connection. And I didn't really start sailing seriously until I got to college when I discovered they had a team and a sport. And it was actually fun to practice. So I ended up doing it a lot, um, more than I probably should have, actually. Um, and so I spent a bunch of time doing that. And then after I got out of college, uh, like most liberal arts undergraduates, I didn't have much going on for me other than applying to law school, which I did in multiple occasions. But I kept finding good sailing gigs. And um, it, in, in my generation, um, there wasn't such a thing as professional sailing. And so the only route into sailing a lot and getting your fix was to uh, go to work for a sailmaker, which is what I did. And uh, for the last 30 plus years, I've been involved in the industry in, in some way, shape or form. Um, and obviously, I've gotten to done a lot of sailboat racing in that time. Um, and uh, I spent uh, my entire 90s and 2000s basically racing offshore one design classes um, and helping and coaching um, uh, owner owners in, in, in the sport. Um, I've had the pleasure of sailing with Greg Gendel um, uh, a number of times. Um, uh, he's one of the very best bow people in the world. And uh, I think uh, he should be able to give us some tips about um, what it takes to be a good one. All right. That's great. So, um, so Dave, David, I've probably known you for a dozen years, you know, through friends here in Annapolis. But Greg, Greg and I go way back. I, I know I have known Greg since he was in college, and we actually taught sailing together at the Annapolis Sailing School. And um, I can tell you, Greg was very, very quiet back in those days. And he's, it seems that uh, he's uh, been in the press a few times since then. He's, uh, he's become quite chatty. So Greg, why don't you tell us a little bit about your sailing background? Because I know there was a lot of it even before. Um, I met you back in the uh, early 90s at Annapolis Sailing School. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So um, my family, we moved to uh, where my parents still live up in on the Magathy River when I was seven years old. And um, my dad bought a little O'Day Day Sailor and we all, the whole family kind of learned to sail together. And then he bought a, he had a couple of PHRF boats um, that we, he started racing. And then we started racing together and learning, um, learning how to race as a family. So uh, back when we first started, Dave, my brother Dave actually did the bow, and uh, I was uh, I was a trimmer, and then at some point we switched. But um, so my dad had a S two seven point nine called Bang that we sailed through um, through the mid eighties, and then he moved on to a Lindenberg twenty eight um, as well after that. And at that point, though, I started um, I started sailing with other people a lot more when he had the Lindenberg. Um, so like Dave said, I worked for a sailmaker. I worked for Jim Cullen. Um, he had the Harstic Loft for a long time, then it later became Banks. I, um, that was, I started the, uh, at Harstic in 1989 when I was 19. Um, and the sailing school, I skipped that. So yeah, the sailing school was a fun job. I, I taught sailing from 1986 to 1990. And uh, that was a, a lot of fun. Um, and Molly, I think, uh, yeah, we definitely worked together. I met my wife, Pam, there, um, which was which was awesome. Um, so then from there, uh, the sailing school, and then, and then at the loft, I started at that point, Jim Cullen, I think, recognized that I was pretty good at, at, at sailing, and he allowed me to sail on other, um, with uh, boats that weren't, I wasn't necessarily representing the loft, and, uh, so got some good breaks with that um, through the mid '90s, um, and uh, did the Admirals Cup in '95 and the Kenwood Cup the next summer. Those were some of my big breaks, um, and then certainly I did the Whitbread Round the World race in the '97 '98 race um, when I was 27. Sailed with Chessie Racing. Um, I did every leg of that. I don't know if we'll talk about that later or not, but that uh, we could probably do a whole show just on that. Um, and then after the Whitbread, once you get a Whitbread on your resume, believe it or not, it's actually pretty easy to, uh, at that point, to become a professional, to have a professional sailing career. So I did, uh, I did two America's Cups after that. Um, did both, both events were in New Zealand in 2003. And then from there, um, you know, kind of uh, from there, I sailed in the 52s a lot. I did some transatlantic races um, and, and you know now uh, I sail on maybe three or four different boats a year now. Um, but that's sort of my my background. 
That's cool. <clears throat> Who knew back in the days when you were beating us at the, in the instructor race in a rainbow that you were going to have such an illustrious career as a bowman? Um, so, David, let's talk about fitness. Um, you mentioned it in your article, and uh, I, I'm I just like to people ask that question: uh, How fit do you need to be to be on the bow? Uh, fitter than I am um, is certainly one way to put it. Um, it's you know, it's funny, a lot of us who, especially of the earlier generations before Greg, um, when we first got into sailing big boats, we got put up on the bow for whatever reasons, because we were young and dumb and, you know, it seems like, no, you know, go ahead, they, they won't get hurt too badly up there. And it was also kind of glamorous. I mean, the, the bow person, you know, it's, they're, they're kind of, uh, they got some, they got some real things going for them. And so we always aspired to be Bowman. And in, in so many sailors, uh, you know, uh, you know, like Jeff Ewens and Mary's husband, you know, we started on the bow. Um, and I wasn't really very good at it. So I, I got shuffled back and do uh, other things. But I will say this physically about doing the bow, you have to be coordinated, you have to have a really good sense of balance. And you don't have to be the biggest, strongest person in the world. That's kind of the, the cool thing about it. Matter of fact, you may not want to be the biggest person because who wants all that weight up there anyway? Uh, but so you need strength to weight ratio, really. And that's why you see actually a lot of women are very good uh, bow persons because it's it's a natural for them. So if you're quick and you're agile and you get a good sense of balance, those are the important characteristics of the whole thing. I don't have any of those anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, a couple of those I never did have. You know, I remember being a younger woman and having people say, you should learn how to do the bow. And I said, I'm not that quick. I'm just not that quick. And I didn't have the drive. I think you have to have some drive in order to do the bow. So Greg, can you can you um, add to what David was saying and maybe give us a little bit about your personal fitness routine to stay fit enough to be super competitive on the bow? Sure. Yep. Yep. So, um, yeah, the bow is fairly physical. A lot of bowmen are, uh, or bow, bow people, I should say, uh, are built wiry, um, kind of like, like me. Um, and for my fitness, yeah, as Dave said, there's a lot of like, uh, stability, a lot of agility, a lot of balance. Um, there's a lot of, uh, and then in the, like the 52 racing and a lot of the racing, a lot of things, there, there, there are things that have to happen very quickly and there'll be some hard exertions where there'll be some hard exertions where you might, um, you know, it might be a 10 or 15 second exertion, but while you're doing it, it it's, it's quite demanding. So, so what I do, I do a bit of yoga, like every day before I sail on the 52 or the 44, or some of the bigger programs, I, I'll do a bit of yoga in the morning just to loosen up and to get the blood flowing a little bit, maybe a 10 or 12 minute routine. Uh, and then I ride bikes a lot uh, for, for cardio. Um, I do a lot of core stability type stuff um, in the gym, uh, some stuff on like a Swiss ball, um, and then some weight training as well. I hit you know, different, uh, I haven't done much the last three months for weight training, but, but just uh, hit different muscle groups on different, different days. Um, and I also do, the, I have a rowing machine also that uh, I have a love-hate relationship with. <laughs> yeah. Do, does it bother your knees at all, this rowing machine? The rowing machine, I found yeah, I mean, well, that's one thing that's interesting. The rowing machines, typically at gyms, there are usually not many people on them because I find that you can't really cheat a rowing machine. Like, you can't get on it and cruise that much. <laughs> like, you know, it's a hard machine, and you have to be mentally tough. And, you know, sailors typically are mentally tough. But um, the rowing machine, I think it's hard on your back. It hard meaning, you know, sailing's hard on your back also. But I think you have to have a strong back and strong legs and strong knees, which is good on the rower and on the on the boat as well. So, well, great. So, um, let's talk about preparation. Uh, I know it was a big piece of your article, Dave, and, and some of the common mistakes that people make, um, or or not even mistakes, but you know something that they always need to work on. It had a lot of it had to do with preparation. So, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. But before I do though, I will say there is one more key physical trait that you need as a bow person. You got to be a little fearless because you're the person wearing that harness. And when things go wrong, which they will do periodically, you're the one they're sending bounding up the mast in the middle of the night, uh, you know, with the, you know, 10 foot seas running and stuff like that. So it takes more courage than I ever had too. I, I prefer to stay where it's safe. But back to the preparation thing. I mean, Greg will, do a better job of pointing that out than me. But 
you know, once the race is happening, there's not really, the moves are fairly simple and straightforward if everything is led correctly. And having all your sheets and stuff set up and having your spinnakers packed and good bow people religiously do this stuff themselves, right? They, they don't trust somebody else to pack their spinnaker or check and see if their lines are. It's just like a parachute for a skydiver. You know, you, you have to make sure your gear and equipment is right. And especially on these modern high performance boats where we're doing things like string drops and stuff like that, you know, if that string isn't led perfectly, um, what could be a great device and make your takedown really simple can make it absolutely impossible. I think, Greg, I was watching one of your videos and you said either you either live by the string or you die by the string if you do right. it wrong. So it's having, you know, the bow team is usually the first team down in the boat. They got to make sure all the sails are packed. They got to make sure their lines are right. All their little pieces of gear and equipment have to be in just the right place. So when it, when the action hits, um, you can have an absolute minimum number of movements. Great. Can you maybe give us a couple of examples or or, um, or expand upon the live and die by the string? Sure. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So our string line, um, it's uh, a system that when it when it works well, and it, our string's very reliable and the system works and, um, you know, it, it all works. But the, the point is that you just go really far into the lured mark before you actually drop. So, like, you might only be a boat length away and the boat's going pretty quick when you go to drop because they ease everything and the, the sail gets stuck, sucked through the front hatch and it all happens very, very quickly, like in literally like four or five seconds, the spinnaker's away and the guys, you know, they're connected to the handles that, that bring the spinnaker in and then they click out of the, the string and then they click in to trim the sails in as you go around the mark. So the point of that is, is when it works well, it, it works very well and the kite comes down, you trim the sails in and go around the mark. But the fact that when, when it, occasionally when it doesn't work well, when you die by the string, it's when you pushed it in very, very far to the mark and it doesn't work and you have to do a manual, which means the helmsman has to keep the bow down for a little bit to keep the apparent wind off the sail. You pull it in by hand and meanwhile you've sailed past the mark uh, until the spinnaker is under control and safe. And then you can then you can turn the corner and go upwind. So that's sort of what we say. Yeah, you live by the string, you die by the string um, on that one. Can you, um, can you tell us maybe about um, uh, a time when you weren't prepared enough when when something happened up there. Yeah. Okay. So uh, on the on the quantum racing, uh, I've been lucky enough. Uh, quantum racing. We started in two thousand eight, and um, so this is our what twelfth or thirteenth year together. And um, I've I've done every every year and every regatta um, on that boat. So we've we've I've got a lot of experience on that boat. And um, with that, there was, um, you know, the other thing with the string, not only if it doesn't work, but sometimes, you know, when you use everything off, the sail can hit the water. And then obviously if when the sail hits the water and you shrimp, then that that's not a good look. So we had a very good streak going for a long time where we never actually, uh, a sail, we never actually shrimped at the bottom mark. And I think we're probably the only boat in the fleet that could say that. And we had a new boat in 2015 and the boat was a little bit late. In the first regatta, we weren't quite prepared and we, we had to go racing and uh, because the boat was late and we didn't have all the little systems in place. So, you know, nowadays there's, when you pull the spinnaker up, there's a reel down below that you, uh, you pull this, like you're starting a lawnmower, you pull a rope and the spinnaker halyard gets loaded onto this drum down below and it just gets, it, it gets taken out of the way. So the, the spinnaker halyard, instead of uh, the pit man feeding it into a, into a bag or a hole, the spinnaker hire gets loaded on a drum very, very quickly, like in like in five seconds and it's done. So we didn't have all those little things put uh, set up at that time in 2015. So anyway, we went to a lured mark and um, we released the tack line and the halyard. Both of them came out of these makeshift bags down below. They weren't quite stuffed properly and both of them had little kinks in them. They both made it to the jammers and stopped and the guys were going on the string. But meanwhile, the, the sail ended up hitting the water and uh, that was the only time in, in 12 years and we shrimped at that lured mark and uh, myself and Tom Burnham were, uh, were were pretty proud of the fact that uh, for a long time we never shrimped at the lured mark but that was that was one <laughs> <laughs> how many boats did you lose uh, I can't remember exactly I mean for sure when that <laughs> happens and, and sometimes there'll be boats in the fleet that that'll happen to and and uh, you're probably last coming out, out of that mark yeah because you have to stop the boat. You usually have to go head to wind and stop the boat. And, and 
everybody on board has to haul the kite back on the boat. Yeah, I, I've, I've been there. The lured mark is the place where there is the most room for downside risk in terms of doing things incorrectly. I'd say it's the hard one to get around. That's right. Yep. Now, I'm going to ask both of you in, 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 in terms of this preparation thing, when you're watching other boats, and probably, David, this question applies to you more. I'm not, I'm not sure about you, Greg, but when you're watching other boats out there, what are some common preparation mistakes you see other boats making? Oh, there's all kinds of stuff. The, in the, the typical thing is just having something led incorrectly. You know, it's the spinnaker sheet that's underneath the lifelines, and the spinnaker starts to go up, and then, oops, uh, it's not going up anymore. Um, or uh, things like no communication between the back of the boat and the front of the boat, um, usually the back of the boat's fault. Uh, and uh, the, the, the front of the boat not being prepared for, for say, hey, I, I want to do an early job, you know? And so uh, the spinnaker goes up and kind of fills everything, but nothing else is ready for the job. So uh, there's, there's a communication issue too that goes into this whole thing. I mean, the bow team has to understand what's coming up for them. Uh, Greg has to know before we get to the top mark, uh, well, at some point fairly shortly thereafter, what kind of set this is going to be, jive or standard whether we need an early jive, whether we intend to stay and extend on that, all that changes what stuff he has to worry about when. So some of the preparation stuff is, is also a, a level of communication and that is often missing from boats. The, 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 the back of the boat is just not painting a clear enough picture so that the front of the boat can execute. Do you have anything to add to that, Greg? Well, as far as the preparation goes, uh, I mean, I agree with what Dave said uh, 100%, but uh, the preparation, um, you know, I like for everything to look, you, you, know, you have to be really familiar with your equipment and and um, and I like for everything to look, you know, exactly the same every time so that there are no surprises. So everything from, you know, the pre-feeders, the halyards, the, 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 the way the hatch works, the way the spinnaker sits down below, like, I have a repeatable process and, and it has to, it, it, I try to make it look the same every single time. So that way there are no surprises. So every time I open the front hatch, I know exactly where everything is. And I like everything to be tidy and organized um, again. So there are no surprises. And a lot of that starts with the preparation and just being familiar with the equipment on the boat. Cause there's a lot of equipment, you know, even the sail bags and the corners of the sails and the sheets, you know, there's a lot of equipment in sailing and it really pays to be, familiar with the equipment so you know exactly what you're working with. And it can be hard when you jump from boat to boat because it does take a while. There's a learning curve when you get on a boat to learn the way that that boat does it. And, um, but when you sail on one boat for a long time, then obviously you become quite familiar with it. Great. Um, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit, David, you, you, you wrote a little bit about having a game plan in terms of mechanics. Can you talk a little bit about having a game plan? Sure. I mean, basically, you know, it, it, as Greg will tell you, each you, there's only so many evolutions on the sailboat, right? You're going to set a spinnaker. You're going to drive a spinnaker. You're going to take it down. You know, you're going to tack the boat. For each of those exercises, there needs to be a definitive ballet that's going to go on. This is what I'm going to do in this order. Uh, and it may change a little bit when, it, you know, from a jive set to a spare away set. And certainly, Boats are going to be different. I mean, sailing with a symmetrical spinnaker is going to be different than sailing with a, an asymmetrical spinnaker. And, you know, high performance boats with string drop systems are going to have a little bit of different stuff. But Greg's going to know going into the top mark exactly what his order of business is, when he's going to pull the tack of the spinnaker out to the pole, uh, when he's going to clear the halyard and have it ready to go. Uh, if he's going to take the jib down, just when is that jib going to come, or is it going to stay up? I mean, a modern fast boat, you typically leave it up and over 10 or 12 knots of breeze. But there will be, you're basically doing something by rope that you've done a thousand times and, and, and you figured out the cleanest, simplest ways to do it so that you know when you're coming in, it's okay, we're going to, I'm going to clear the halyard. All right, that's ready to go. I'm going to pre pull the, the, the tack of the spinnaker out to the pole. That's done. Um, I'm going to make sure the spinnaker comes out of the hatch and doesn't get cummed up, uh, hooked up on something. Uh, I'm going to make sure the lazy sheet's free. Um, you know, I'm gonna, and then I'm going to take the jib down and then I'm going to put my weight where it belongs, whatever that is. But so for each evolution, you can have a playbook. 
Um, and that playbook will be different from boat to boat. Um, and it'll be different, you know, depending on your sort of personnel package and who, who can do what. But it's, I mean, I'm sure on the quantum racing team, having sailed together forever, that everybody on the boat knows exactly what the other person is doing in every maneuver, which is also helpful too, because if something's going wrong, then you can turn around and know where to help. So yeah, got to have a playbook. Greg, do you, do you have anything to add to that? And we, we have at least one question from the audience, but I'll let you respond to that too about, you know, having a game plan. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. As Dave said, well, the repetition too, like, um, you know, doing things over and over, you learn the rhythm of it. As you come to the windward mark, you learn, as Dave said, you know, when to re when the hired gets taken up and when the tack comes out and, and all the little routines. Um, and, and with that, um, you know, you, you know, I said I did a, a talk for with um, with Ed Baird a couple of weeks ago, and and with that, with doing the bow, a lot of um, there was a lot of experience goes a long way in this in sailing, and you gain experience by making mistakes. So, and you, by making mistakes, the next time you know what to watch out for, so you don't make the same mistake again. So, you know, I've done bow for a very very long time, and clearly I've made a lot of mistakes over over the years, but I just try not to make the same mistake again. So um, having that routine and getting in your rhythm is important. But as Dave said earlier too, uh, occasionally, um, you know, when, when, when stuff goes wrong, you have to be able to execute a, a plan B and a bailout plan quickly. And you have to, and that's another thing where when things go wrong and you do execute your, your, your bailout to fix the, fix the problem, you know, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And you have to make a very split decision um, on how to fix it. And, and hopefully it's the right way to do it. And if it's not, then you got to think of maybe a better way to do it quickly. But, but having that, um, you know, just seeing things go wrong and having a plan to fix them is important too. Sure, you want to pop that question up there? Uh, the whole question isn't showing up. Can you, can you talk about the role of the bow person on a big boat during the pre-start and, and start and how that has changed with the evolution of electronics? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and it has changed a lot, and it continues to evolve. So, so with that, um, you know, the GPSs have gotten more. The whole software technology has gotten very accurate, and the performance of the boat is all uh, all the data, um, and um, it's all there's a lot of software involved in, in the starting, of especially the 52s, and even like the far 40s and stuff. And smaller boats have a a more basic version where you ping the ends. And then, um, so the software helps a lot there. Where it's changed is like in the 52 class, the, the difference sometimes between a good start and a, or a great start or a workable start and a not so good start could be maybe even a second or a half a second behind the boats around you. You know, if you can't, if it's really important to hold your lane and you're just a little bit, a little bit weak off the starting line, you can't hold your lane, you have to tack out. And next thing you know, everybody from the other side crosses you because you had to do that clearing tax. So, so the point of that is, is the starts have become very important. And with this software, uh, the the accuracy at the starting line has gotten very, very um, close. So it can be the, the difference of a quarter, literally a quarter of a second can be whether or not you're over the line or you're just safe. So it's hard to call that for a human going, you know, the 52 goes nine knots upwind in a breeze. So as you reach and build speed, you might go over 10 knots before you actually uh, sheet on and go upwind. So, you know, it can be difficult to call a quarter of a second accuracy. So the software helps a lot there. And then, um, and, and I give my gut feeling as well. And I give my input um, to the helmsman and, and the, the navigator is looking at his uh, iPad. So the helmsman basically gives, gives the three, gives, uh, they have their gut feeling they have my input and then the navigator's input. And then they do, they, they take all those factors and they, you know, and they, they do what they want to do based on that. So it's changed a lot. So the, the boats have gotten a lot closer to the starting line, which, which actually puts a lot of pressure on me. Um, and, and it is a, uh, it's an intense situation when we're starting at 52, because there's a lot on the line and the boats are close. Anything to add to that, Dave? Does Ed listen to you? Sorry, Dave. Does Ed listen to you? Does he listen to me? He does listen. To me. <laughs> Will you put the big fist up and say no? <laughs> we have done a lot of starts together. I think he knows my body language also. 
Yeah. So he sees me when I'm looking from side to side very, very closely. And sometimes I'll even lean back a little bit. I think he knows that we're very close then. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's where the yoga comes into play. Your back bends um, yeah. on the bow there. Uh -huh. The important thing is to never see your bow man just turn around and walk back from the bow. I mean, it's telling you that you're so late that just you – You've had a hopeless start. And he's ashamed of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of our coaches, uh, Stevie Erickson's a good friend and a good coach. And he says that those are born born wrong. So it's not really <laughs> anything the Bowman can do. It's just from like 40 seconds out or a minute out that it's right. born wrong. So, yeah. So, um, oh, Mark Burroughs. Hello, Mark. Uh, fixing stuff is pre required, is a prerequisite. What was your best recovery from a cluster? Well, I, okay, so uh, I'll try to think. I, there was a good, I told a good one a few weeks ago on quantum racing. I'll try to think of a, of a better one. That one was pretty good, though. So um, I, some people may have heard this one a, a few weeks ago. But um, on the 52, we were coming in. You know, we, we go downwind. The spinnaker's obviously up. The jib comes down in the lighter breeze. The staysail goes up. The staysail's on a furler. And uh, the top furling unit is a little head swivel. And on that head swivel is a little spectra loop that's maybe four inches long. So the jib halyard gets clipped into that to pull the staysail up. So we were coming into the leeward mark. We weren't far away from the leeward mark. And it's, there's, it's a one design race. There's a lot of boats around, you know, a lot of close quarters, some jibing and keeping their air clear. And we're coming into the leeward mark. We're maybe, you know, maybe two minutes from the leeward mark, probably closer. And that little spectra loop broke. So when that spectra loop broke, of course, the staysail that's unfurled falls from the sky and into the water. So, okay, you know, and we're hyper aware. So as, as it falls, you know, we get half of it gathered in before the head even hits the water. And okay, so the, the staysail's on board, gets shoved down below really quickly. But the problem now is that the halyard we need to pull the jib up is at the top of the mast. So, um, and the and the spinnaker, the spare spinnaker, the spinnaker's up. So the spare spinnaker halyard's also at the top of the mast. We have a mouse line on that. So we quickly pull the mouse line down, I hook into that halyard and you know the boat's going whatever it's going 10 or 12 knots at the leeward mark so the guys grind me up as quick as they can i go up grab the halyard the jib halyard and you know the mark's not far away so i grab the jib halyard and the pit man obviously has it out of the cleat or whatever and i slide down the forestay and that's something we used to do in the whitbread we used to come down the forestay was kind of a fast way to come down and I haven't done it much recently, but um, you can come down very quickly that way because the pit man, you don't have to worry about the spreaders and stuff. So I slide down the forestay, um, you know, with the spinnaker hired on me, and I just signal, signal the pit man, like, get me down quickly because this mark's coming up. So he smokes me down the forestay, my feet hit the deck, I take the jib halyard off, put it on the head of the jib right when we need to hoist it anyway. So the mark's only like whatever, when we hoist the jib up, maybe it's 15, 20 seconds away. Click it on the head of the jib, jib goes up on the lock, approaching the leeward mark, and then we do the, the spinnaker drop just as everything you know, else, just, just as we had planned. So that, that was actually a pretty good one. <laughs> that just sounds like something that would leave a lot of marks all over your body. Um, you, you, I, I know that's one of our questions. Are you heavily bruised after, after a, a maneuver like that? Well, I, there's a lot of adrenaline. And um, you know, when you go up the mass in a race like that, there's a lot of adrenaline. So I probably could have climbed the four day without the halyard, but uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you do, you get banged up and you just take it on. Uh, like, like I said, the adrenaline's pumping and especially in waves, you can get pounded feet up up there. Um, and anytime you have to go out in the end of the prod, that now is probably the most dangerous thing that I have to do is slide out of the end of the prod. You don't have, you try to make it so you don't have to go out there very often because it's slippery and the little, the, the uh, bob stays, we call it, you know, the thing that supports the prod. Um, is slippery and it's underwater. So when the boat, you know, if it dips the bow down while you're out there is when you can get swept off. And of course, if you get swept off, then the boat will run you over. So that, that's the most dangerous thing I have to do. So when, when we have to do that, I, I usually, uh, you know, try to do it quickly as well and get out there, do what I have to do and then get back in and, uh, and, you know, just to, to minimize my time out there and exposure. Wow. Well, good question. Great answer. A lot yep. of excitement. Um, can we talk about priorities? Let's talk, uh, Dave, you, you wrote a bit about the what should be a, a bow person's top priorities. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, well, you, you noticed, by the way, there was another, the physical attributes I talked about, fearlessness. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sliding down 
the force day. You know, there, there are better people for that than me. Um, but in terms of uh, what you see in, in, in all the great Bao people I've been, I've been fortunate to sail with is that uh, a couple of things. One is they have tactical sense. I mean, they fully understand what is going on on the racetrack. And on modern boats, like on the boats Greg sailing on, things like, you know, um, time to the ley lines, and we've got, you know, five minutes on port and two minutes on starboard, all that is up on the big screen right at the mast. So uh, knowing where you are on the course is, is, is part of it. But, you know, good, good bow people realize that, hey, look, we spent our whole upwind leg on starboard tack. Well, I'm going to probably need to jibe pretty quickly at this top mark. It's, I, I'm, I'm thinking a jibe set here because, I mean, if we were all on starboard upwind, we're probably going to be all on port downwind. Um, and, and so that's sort of a tactical awareness. A good bow team, you don't have to tell them. There's no like, okay, uh, get the spinnaker hired ready or, you know, when to pre-pull the tack. And they do that all in their own sense of timing because they – understand where you are on the race course and what's got to happen. They, they don't wait to get yelled at to do something. And, and if they do, you, they're not going to be a very good bow team. Um, you know, likewise, you know, when you're coming into the lured mark, uh, you know, the, the really great bow teams come in any way you want. You want to jive? Oh, that's the last second. I don't care. I'm ready for anything. Right. And so, you know, when you first start the bow, it's it's you're you're nervous, and there's you know I've got to remember these steps and these the word marks are hard and all this stuff, and I got to do this thing. And but as you get better at it, uh, you you you're you're, comp you, you're ready for anything. And the the best bow teams, you the tactician can change his mind at the last second. Oh no, we're going to the left hand gate, and they calmly just sort of take it in stride um, and, and 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 get things done. And then I guess the last great thing that I see in the really the best bow teams and, and, and Greg is, is really good at this. He always very, very quiet and always very calm. If you're yelling and screaming, you have lost control of the situation, basically. Um, uh, you know, yes, you have to rush sometimes, you know, when the pressure's on and I got that mark coming up and I got to get that higher and get it down and get it on the jib. I'm pretty fired up, but like yelling and screaming doesn't help that whole program at all. And the best bow teams are really um, very quiet and and are pretty much ready for it. Now they may turn around to you at some point when you're the tactician and, and have made some bonehead mistake and say, "Hey, okay, you want this? You you may have to own this rounding. This may not go as well as you think." All right, but, but and I, I've had and Greg's turned around and told me that before, um, but. That's 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 entirely reasonable. But but the good bow teams are have a great tactical mind themselves. They're just good sailors. They uh, so they can they can anticipate what's what's coming up. They're ready for anything, and they're cool, calm, and collected when things are going poorly. Have anything to add to that, Greg? And top priorities for a bow person or qualities of a of a top bow person? Yeah, Dave said it really well, a lot of that, I think. Um, and, you know, I'm going to just say, agree with what he said. Coming into the lured mark, like the tactician, a lot of times they're going to change. Coming into a gate, you know, they're, they're going to have a plan. But if it, if it looks better at the other mark and it's going to happen, they're going to go to the other mark. And you have to be ready for that. So and it's, it's going to happen a lot. So, you know, the only thing like – the only thing that you can't really do on most boats is, uh, except for when it's really light, you can. But uh, you don't want to drop and then jive while you're dropping because that's when the, the spinnaker, can, spinnaker can go directly in front of the boat and you'll run it over. So but you have to be able to go to either mark any time. And as Dave said, at the, the windward mark, um, you know, again, you know when it's the right shift right at the top that you might – you're going to want to get onto port quickly or it might be a jive set. Um, you're just aware of that situation. Like even before, you know, we'll talk about it in a little group up front here, like be ready. For, we call it an Indian on, um, on quantum racing, the jive set move. Uh, you know, we'll be ready for, an, you know, it could be an Indian here sort of thing. And then the tacticians, yeah, you know, maybe 15 seconds later, they'll call an Indian or something. We'll be like, okay, well we knew that already. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, thinking, um, and then as Dave said too, like uh, knowing how much time you have on each tack or on each jibe coming into the leeward mark, like if you have to do a jib change downwind, 
typically, uh, you know, you have to know how much time you have on each jibe. This might be better to flake the jib on port jibe, for example, or, and um, so have, knowing how much time you have on each jibe is important and upwind as well, because there might be stuff you have to do on starboard tack and stuff you have to do on port tack um, for the cleanup um, is important. Um, so yeah, D Dave said it all pretty well there, I think. Um, see what else I can, uh, what was the other part of that question or was that? Well, um, it, was, it was sort of a combined question, the yeah. top qualities of a great bow person, but also top priorities um, of a great bow person. Yeah, yeah, so thinking like a tactician, as Dave said, uh, calm, cool, and collected is another good one. Um, you know, try not to uh, to raise the, the fever on the boat, as we say, uh, just keep it all calm, goes a long way also. So, yeah, not, nothing really to add. Great. We have, um, we have another question from the audience. A couple decent questions tonight. Best way for a 33-year-old to get into the sailing industry. He's only done the A to B once. Uh, do you want to take a bit? Oh, boy. Sorry. Um I'm not sure that getting into the sailing industry is going to be your <laughs> ticket to, to fame and glory. I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> my wife would tell you that's a real sacrifice, actually. Um, you know, I, I can tell you, though, what's interesting in our industry now, and because I've worked in the sailing industry forever, um, Greg's spent his, some time there, and he's, he's been more as a pro sailor, is that um, in the sailing industry itself, the part that makes stuff, you know, like we make sales, um, there actually, there is a dearth of a new generation of young people. Uh, of uh, we, we we were getting we're getting older, you know, and and not that many people are leaving. Um, and so we actually are looking for young people who want to do it, who are willing to sacrifice their time and their economic well-being, and you know all that stuff. <laughs> Interestingly enough, up until recently. The pro sailing thing, which didn't exist when I started in the whole thing, the pro sailing thing has actually become a pretty good pipeline for young, hot sailors. You know, the kids coming out of college and things like that. I mean, that they've been getting into, you know, through the class like the J seventy and things like that. They've been getting a, a, a lot of gigs that didn't exist for us, you know, back when. And certainly, that's not the way you know Greg went about it. Um, so I see the young sailors as having a, a pipeline potentially almost straight into the into the pro sailing industry if if it survives the pandemic which we're not sure it will um into the sailing industry itself and making things i think first of all you have to realize that it ain't that glamorous and you're making products and selling products and you know i got into it because it was the way i could you know i could sail all the time um and and feed my habit but it, it's really not that way much anymore. Um, the that has gone over to the professional sailing side of things, um, and you know the, the 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 sailmaker that comes in your sail bag uh, isn't as big a part of the program as it once was. Yeah. Oh, that, I was going to ask the question about the shoes. I like because <laughs> I, I like a really specific question like that. The the complete question I can see here. What should I look for in shoes for the bow? It seems most are made for the cockpit. The soles are um, have ninety degree angles, which don't work for crouching and whatnot. Um, and the heels slip out when doing more athletic moves. So, what do you guys recommend in footwear for the bow? Footwear for the bow. I would say the uh, Adidas shoes are. Uh a lot of people are using those right now. They sort of built in scuppers, which can let the water, uh, that lets the water out, but it also lets the water in, of course. But, um, but the Adidas shoes are pretty nice. And it's funny because on the boats, most of the boats I sail on, I'm one of the only ones that wears like traditional sailing shoes. And I say traditional, meaning like the, the tennis style sailing shoes, the Sperry's or the Henry Lloyd's. Um, and uh, I'm one of the only ones that wears those. Most of the guys in the cockpit, um, wear like Nike, Nike freeze or something they're called, um, that do have the more heel support. And the only, the only, the reason I still go stick with traditional athletic sailing shoes is because I know the soles are going to be really sticky up front. It's that soft rubber compound and I need good traction. I need to be able to trust my footing. So that's why I stick with those. And most of the boats I sail on have the foamy cockpit sole 
um, so they don't need the ultra good sticky soles because they have that that the foamy cockpit um, that does it does it for them. So, David, yeah. what do you what do you wear back there in the afterguard? <laughs> um, you guys wear shoes? Oh no, yeah, no shoes are good. <laughs> Take your toe to it. I, I actually for years I, I I played squash forever, and squash shoes are the perfect sailing shoes because they are really gummy on the bottom. And the, the bottoms go away pretty quickly. They don't last very long. You can only wear them on the boat, you know, or they're, they're too soft. But um, any of the high-end squash shoes are great sailing shoes. They don't drain as well necessarily as some of that, but they, the grip is, is fantastic. And, and I also wear, I, I do wear Adidas uh, uh, sailing shoes. I think, I think they work great. So um, last question before we have last call here, um, you know, Probably most of the people who are watching aren't uh, in a super high-end racing program. So if you can give some tips to someone who wants to up their game on the bow, hey, in a Wednesday night race off Annapolis or one of our ordinary weeknight races here, and they just want to improve their game on the bow, what would you recommend to them? David, you want to lead here? I'll, I'll lead with that one. So, I mean, let's put it this way. A good bow person is worth their weight in gold, right? I mean, they make things tick and they make it work. And so if you are, are, are willing to dedicate yourself and do the kind of things that Greg has talked about, you know, do the physical training and be in good condition and you're the first one down on the boat and you're making sure everything's meticulously prepared and the lines are just so and the spinnaker pack is packed everything and you're doing the, you have a routine, you're doing things the same way every time. Uh, and you have, you know, a good sense of anticipation and you're quiet and calm and, and boy, very quickly, it's going to become known that people want you on their boat. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think if you follow some of the guidelines we've talked about here of, of things that you need to do and just try to implement them, you know, to, to go out there and, and just get them done, you're going to find yourself pretty quickly on demand. You know, if you start at the Wednesday night level locally, well, all of a sudden somebody's going to realize that, you know, hey, do you want to come do some bigger races and things like that? And that's uh, the, the way up the ladder is there. there is no substitute for, you know, working at it and, you know, ha and developing a skill set, you know, um, but it, it, that is all doable. It's trainable. It's not a, you know, you don't have to be born with it. You don't have to have some, you know, perfect pitch or, you know, some innate, you uh, uh, skill set. Um, if you're reasonably competent and fit and willing to work at it, you can do it. How about you, Greg? Yeah. What advice would you give to someone who wants to improve their their um, skills on the bow? Yeah, I think uh, having a good attitude and um, and uh, yeah, having a good attitude and asking questions, uh, taking notes is important. Um, yeah, I love it when, it, it, like I said earlier, experience goes a long way. And of course, the only way, way to get experience is to get out there and do it. And if you can sail uh, uh, different styles of boats, like some inshore racing and some offshore racing and, and ask questions, um, you can learn bits and pieces from a lot of different people on a lot of different boats. So it helps to uh, helps to, to do that, just to make yourself well-rounded as a sailor and as a bowman. Um, the other thing I do is I take no, a lot of notes. Um, I used to do, I used to have wet notes and now I've gone to electronic notes, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll write down the, the, especially as I jump around from boat to boat, what works on that particular boat. And uh, a lot of times it's what mistakes we made, um, how the boat was set up. Uh, just so I remember, you know, sometimes it might be a year before I go back and sail on the same boat. And if I can show up with the mental picture of what has worked on that boat before, it, it goes a long way. So. So I think taking notes is important, having a good attitude, asking questions, um, and uh, yeah, showing up fit like like we already talked about. Um, that, that's all that stuff goes a long way. That's um, it's great to hear you talking about um, taking notes. As I've interviewed a lot of really good sailors over the years, and just about all of them talk about keeping some sort of a journal of their experiences and. And after the race, they actually write down this happened and this this happened well. I did this well. I didn't do this well. These are things that I remember. And they go back and refer to them and, and learn from them. So I think um, that might be sort of the difference between excellent bow people and, and those of us who are just doing it for, for, for kicks, you know. So 
Thank you. And David Flynn from Quantum Sales and Greg Gandell, also from Quantum. Bauman, you guys have so much experience and we are really honored to have you join our happy hour. And uh, I always learn a lot from these things, but it's really a, a pleasure to see you guys, see you guys and, uh, and to share some sailing talk with you and a couple drinks. So anyway, cheers. 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 I hope to, hope to see you again one of these days on another happy hour. And yeah, uh, thank you. Enjoy, enjoy some of this time off that you have right now. <laughs> it's a different kind of a summer for all of us who are in the sailing industry. And um, to the guy who asked the question, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at, at his name right now about the sailing industry there. There are some great jobs out there in the sailing industry. Um, I mean, they, the, you might hear a little negativity going on right now. It might not be the, the ideal week to join the sailing industry, but um, hey, those of us who are in it, we like, to, we like to complain that it takes up our weekends and we don't get to sail as much for pleasure, but hey, we're all still here. <laughs> and we have some pretty cool jobs, you know? So um, thank you guys for joining us. We, uh, we loved having you tonight. And um, thanks for sharing your, your sailing knowledge with, with spin sheets. So Sharp, you want to put us in the green room and wrap up here? I sure will. Um, thanks, thanks guys. Really appreciate it. Just so you know, that gentleman's name is Chris Schaefer. And uh, Chris, uh, I will tell you right now, it, 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 Dave pointed out, yeah, you might have to give up, you know, your, your ideas of financial freedom and that sort of thing if you want to join this business. But um, funny enough, maybe coincidence, maybe this is a sign, but you are our winner of the Boat Life Mildew Remover. If you want to get into the boating industry, <laughs> cleaning boats is a good start. So uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so uh, so uh, congratulations there, um, guys. Stick around in the green room real quick. I just got to take care of a couple of pieces of business here, um, but thanks very much. Bye. Uh, so, uh, like I said, uh, congrats, Chris. Uh, you are the grand. <laughs> you are the uh, welcome to owner of uh, Mildew Remover. I'm going to send you a uh, instant message to get your shipping address. Uh, but we appreciate you tuning in. We appreciate everybody for tuning in. Um, it was, this was really a lot of fun. And uh, uh, it's amazing when, when you get the opportunity to hear people like Dave and Greg talk, you really realize how inexperienced you are. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just uh, in the sailing business, it's rare to be able to listen in on a conversation like this. So we're really happy that we're able to, to do this for, um, you know, for us, for you, for everybody. Um, I think it's exciting when readers get kind of pumped up about this um, and it's exciting uh, that we're able to, to share it um, with, the, you know, with you. So um, anyhow, uh, very good. I wanna just one last shout out to our sponsor, Mount Gay. Thanks very much. Um, I, I will tell you this, um, I, I'm down to, you know, the last drops of my drink. Um, and the coconut, the wa coconut water ice cube, uh, it, it changes the drink as you drink. So it basically tells you a story all the way from the beginning to the end. And uh, I just want to say you might want to try it. It's called, uh, what was it called? It's called the XO Coco and uh, it's delicious. Try it when you get a chance. And tell them Spin Sheet sent you. Appreciate it. Come back. Tune in next week. Fridays at 5. We'll have another uh, Spin Sheet happy hour. And uh, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Get out on the water, and we'll see you next time. Don't miss another Spin Sheet video. Subscribe to our channel today.